Good morning YouTube, Warbles on Lord here. Sunday the 10th of May, it's Mother's Day. Preparing for the Outsiders and the first Moondog will be a separate broadcast as usual. Time now for Outsiders. I'm Barry Cassidy and you're not. And a very good morning to Paula Matthewson, weekly politics columnist for ABC The Drum, Sean Kelly, political editor of The Monthly, and Simon Cowan, research fellow at the Centre for Independent Studies. Welcome to you all. Good morning. What a specky time this is for politics. Am I wrong? <laughs> the UK election was of vast interest, and now we trip lightly into an Australian budget week. This is, this is sort of warm bliss, isn't it, Paula? Absolutely, it's almost impossible to find time to sleep when all of this is going on. <laughs> well, and, and having, we'll, I think we'll come to the UK poll in a moment. Uh, if, if nothing else remarkable in the way that it, it appears to have wrong-footed the punditry, but uh, anyway, it's more of that in the moment. The budget is, of course, looming. Uh, it, it, and some interesting dynamics uh, in this, uh, the, apart from all the economic stuff, about the, the, the background politics uh, and perhaps the role that the Treasurer is playing uh, in the formulation of this one, which might be somewhat altered. This is Laurie Oakes speaking with Joe Hockey earlier this morning. Well, that's a rough thing to do, but I want to read to you what Samantha Maiden read in the Sunday Telegraph this morning. Uh, she says that, uh, that your budget's been adopted out for Scott Morrison. She describes him as the Phantom Treasurer, and she said of you, the poor bastard has been hidden away during the pre-budget week like some sort of pregnant, unmarried teenager in the 1950s. Now, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, it's just another critical voice, Laurie. You know, there are people on the sidelines that like to heckle when someone's kicking for goal to try and distract the kicker, but this kick is going to put it through the post. Sean Kelly, I'm beginning to feel rather sorry for Joe Hockey. Oh, I think so too. You can kind of hear the tears sheltering just behind his voice, can't you? He doesn't mask it. Well. <laughs> I feel like he's he's a little bit like that poor substitute teacher. You know, he, he comes in, everybody yells at him a bit. Uh, he gets called treasurer, but everybody knows he's not really the treasurer. Is that a reaction to the the twenty fourteen Deborah Clay, or just oh, the reality of cabinet government? No, no, ab absolutely. I think the reality is nobody really trusted hockey to manage the budget process effectively this year. Uh, the reports are that Tony Abbott has been chairing the expenditure review committee very forcefully, very strongly actually running the budget process rather than letting Joe Hockey take the running as would normally be the case. You've had Scott Morrison out there for the last couple of weeks really running the public relations side of the budget, leaving Joe Hockey in the shadows. And I think that's a huge problem for Joe because if the budget goes badly, it will absolutely be hung around his neck and he'll be out mm. of his ear. But if it goes well, everybody will say, well, this wasn't really Joe Hockey's budget, was it? So I suspect one way or another, uh, look, I'd be surprised if Joe Hockey was still there in six months. I, I wonder, Simon Cowan, if it's a, a, the sidelining of Joe Hockey in this process, if that's in fact what happens and we can only guess on the outside. Is that a problem too for the economy? I mean, it's Joe ha Joe Hockey that, that carries the flame here uh, of of rigor, I think, within the the economic discussion within the coalition. Sure, and look, I think you know, we've seen a lot of Scott Morrison because there's been a lot of focus on a couple of particular areas for the budget. Big you know, announcement today on on, on family allowances. Mm. Exactly, but that's not all that's in the budget. It is a significant portion of spending. But the overall fiscal settings, the movement back to surplus or not, where revenue sits, all of these things are unquestionably lying with Joe Hockey. They are the elements of the budget that everyone should be most concerned about because I think we haven't seen a narrative. We haven't seen an explanation of what's going to happen there. There's a lot of mixed messages coming forward. Oh, revenue's down. Oh, why don't you go out and spend some money? Um, I think the elements that Joe Hockey is unquestionably responsible for, the elements that are going to determine whether that this budget is a success or failure, we haven't heard much about them at all. And I think that's concerning on a lot of levels. Well, I wonder, Paula Matheson, if, if, if that's because those things are pretty much subdued. I mean, are, are we watching the, the political takeover of this process and in, in seeing as 
as Sean mentions and as, as Peter Martin reports today, the, the, the PM chairing the ERC and taking a very hands-on role, is that getting the politics in order before the economics? Well, it's hard to know at this stage. And my recollection is that uh, Abbott uh, chaired the ERC uh, quite a lot last year in the lead up to the budget and was personally responsible along with his chief of staff for a number of the very, very poor budget decisions in, in that previous budget. So let's see, and you know, mentions being made of the narrative. Uh, I, I think uh, certainly in terms of um, how the business and economic community respond to the, to the budget uh, will, will be the key. Uh, how, how does Hockey dig himself out of the debt and deficit hole? That's mm. going to be the real question. We, we sort of ramp ourselves up for this moment every year and talk about the significance of the budget in, in terms of the annual political landscape. Is that especially true this year? I mean, it, it does seem to be genuinely a lot on this. Well, I think that's the case. But what you see is there's always a big build up to the budget, but only one out of every four or five budgets tends to meet that billing. You know, you, you, we still talk about the budget that Costello delivered in 96. Mm. Um, you know, I think last year's budget was one of those budgets that will make that sort of impact. Um, this year, the government's trying as hard as it can to avoid having a budget that will have that sort of impact because I don't think they have the political capital to sell a tough budget and they don't have the economic capital to sell a weak one. Maybe, um, maybe, maybe, maybe Paula, they should just bill this as, as 2014 budget part B. You know, say so this. <laughs> oh, I don't think they can afford to do that either. I mean, it's they they really just want to draw a line under last year's budget, uh, but equally to have their cake as well because they want to uh, tie some of the budget measures, uh, this year's budget measures, to have to part having passed uh, those from last year, such as in in the family and childcare area. So, uh, but no, look, they want they want this one to drop like a stone, as most budgets do in you know by June, and for the world to go on. Do you think it's likely, Sean Kelly? Look, Jonathan, the truth is most budgets die a long way before June. Most budgets mm. are dead politically within three days. Well, and that's most the great gift of last year is it's still giving. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and and that does happen occasionally. In 1996, uh, Paul Keating was uh, sorry, 1993. Uh, when Paul Keating broke the LAW law tax cuts pledge in the budget, he suffered a huge hit. In 2001, when, jo when John Howard shoveled pork onto the, the shoulders of the, the waiting electorate, he got a big budget pole bounce. But commentators love to talk up the importance of the budget. They love to talk up the expectation of a pole bounce or the government's disappointed that they didn't get a pole, pole bounce. The truth is uh, very, very, very few budgets. In fact, only really mm. in recent times, that 93 budget, that 2001 budget, and last year's budget have had any significant impact on the polls. And I suspect that will be the case this year. And I suspect the Prime Minister will be very happy about that. How much, how much responsibility, uh, Simon, is there on, on the ALP subsequent to this? We've, we've got a, uh, some big measures announced today around, around childcare and, and, and subsidies there. Do you think ALP will back that? Do you think they need to do a bit better than the argument they're making around uh, the part pensions and, and pensions changes, which which seem reasonably fair given the situation, and yet ALP running a very tough scare campaign on that. Do they need to have a bit of a look at their attack policy? Well, I think the bounce that the government has received in the polls, that steady movement back towards, if not you know, a winning position, at least a, an acceptable position, is going to put more pressure on the opposition. Um, Abbott got away with running a very negative campaign at, for a long time because the Labor Party was seen to be in disarray, because they could continually attack these policies. Um, I think that it's likely that the opposition will have to come up with something. I don't think that they'll want to move on pensions. I think they'll keep attacking the areas they've been attacking for the last 18 months, negative gearing, superannuation tax concessions, international tax avoidance, those sort of areas that are playing well for their heart, and I think that's where they'll focus. Mm. But if the government keeps going well, absolutely that'll put pressure on Bill Short. If I, if I can attempt something of a segue here, Paula Matthewson, I mean, the, the, the lesson perhaps out of Labor's miserable performance in, in the UK, and, and this might be heeded by Labor in this country, is to, to get real with economic proposals, to 
deal in the centre economically and make it constructive. Indeed, uh, I think uh, I noticed that, that Tony Blair used uh, uh, a comment in, in one of his res responses to what happened in the UK as, as the electorate defaulting to the Conservatives. And, and that's mm. what happens when, when voters are un uneasy about the alternative when it comes to the issues that are important to them. And economic stability and growth and productivity, even if voters don't think of it in those terms, those are, that's the thing that is usually most important to them. And, and Sean Kelly, in, in, in Britain, um, we no longer have, in that defaulting to Conservatives, the, the default position is no longer Tory light moderated by the Lib Dems. It's full-fledged, albeit narrow majority Tories uh, governing in their own right. What, what difference will that make? I think a, a very, very significant difference. I think David Cameron knows full well that he won this election partly off the back of moving to the right. He started out his term, and he started out his term as opposition leader, in fact, presenting himself as, as quite a moderate new type of Tory. He talked a lot about his, his climate change credentials. Mm. Uh, but in this election, we've seen him, we've seen him move. Yeah, exactly right. And we've seen him move a long way to the right during this campaign because he knew he needed to shore up those votes. He knew he needed to get the Conservative vote out. And I think that will absolutely uh, play a huge role in dictating uh, the ideological tinge to his policies over the next few years. Already we're seeing a lot of talk about the destruction that will be wrought on the national health system. Uh, I think the left of politics in the UK will be very worried indeed. I wonder, Simon Cowan, whether, whether Australian Conservatives will, will take confidence from that. Um, certainly it's possible, but it's always important to remember the differences between the UK electoral system and ours. Um, a situation where you've got uh, non-compulsory voting where you've got a first past the post system very much rewards playing to the base and getting the base out to vote um, with so many parties for so many positions as well you know you, you can even with a fairly ideological line still appear to be more reasonable than some of your opponents uh, in Cameron's case particularly UKIP uh, that's not a position that Tony Abbott finds himself in you know with compulsory voting with uh, preferential voting He's very much got appeal to the middle. Um, and, and the middle of Australian politics, I think, is somewhat different to the middle of, of UK politics as well. Um, you know, there isn't an ideological bent in Australian politics. It's very, very practical. It's very results orientated too. If um, he hasn't got a good story to tell in 18 months time, it won't matter where he ideologically positions himself, mm. I don't think. There was a backbencher quoted in one of the papers yesterday who said, finally, we can see Tony Abbott recently becoming the Prime Minister we've always wanted, a right-wing Prime Minister pretending to be a moderate. Uh, and I think that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> that's, that's very astute. <laughs> is, is, is that, a liberal backbencher, I should add. Is, is that the secret to success, do you think, Paula, that's worth it? For, for <coughs> oh, well, I, could, I think the secret to success is... Uh, find, finding out, you know, and I'll be criticised for this, but it's finding out what oh, people good. want and then <laughs> reflecting it back to them. Uh, you know, that's the whole point of of um, the private opinion polling that, that goes on, and I know that that's criticised for, you know, pol policy by popular demand, but that is is, is really the key to success. I, and, I, and I wonder too whether within the PMO in, in Australia the returning form of the conquering hero Mark Texter might get a better hearing within the uh, the Prime Minister's office subsequent to about, David Cameron's victory. It would be about time if that uh, that does occur. Yes, the, the John Kelly. I mean, I guess that is that what we might uh, see more of in this coming week post budget of that uh, a, a torification of the coalition or will this be a down the middle no I, I think this will be down the middle i think tony abbott's absolute aim here is to come up with a completely uncontroversial budget which as i say will be uh, dead and dusted dead as a dodo just a few days later he wants to move past this he doesn't want the shadows uh, of last year's budget hanging around as paula mentioned before that could be a little bit of a difficulty because in tying some of the measures like the childcare measures this year to the unpopular cuts to family mm. tax benefits from last year, he risks tainting this year's budget uh, with the, the poisonous flavour of last year's, but he will be hoping that is not the case. So no, I think he'll be going for moderate, not conservative. Well, there you go. Tuesday night, the, the message will be nothing to see here. Please move on. Uh, thanks to our outsiders this morning. Over to you. Okay. 
That's the itness of the outsiders.